First of all, thanks to the um, organizing committee for inviting me to give this presentation. Um, a couple of things. Number one, you'll see an ECAT 146428. If you go to the Geoscience Australia's website, that's where you'll be able to find that, this presentation. I believe it will also be downloadable from um, the AIG website too. Greg Corbett said that he's old, so therefore he can have notes. Well, I've got white hair now, so I can have notes too. Okay, so what we're going to do is talk about critical minerals. What are they? What is the potential in Australia? What is the potential in the, East, in the uh, Tasmanites? Now, there's been a lot of interest in critical minerals, basically from the government. There's been a lot of interest from the state governments, from the Commonwealth governments, from other governments around the world. And there's also been an in increasing interest in uh, critical minerals from the general public's perspective. Many of you would have seen the Four Corners program um, on Monday, I think it was. So that gives a background. So the first question I have, or you probably also have too, is what is a critical mineral? Okay. So I've highlighted some important aspects of what a critical mineral in blue. So it's a mineral resource that's essential to the economic and the technological development. So it's essential to the economy but are at risk of supply disruptions. I, someone decides to shut off the supply due to limited resources of supply, i.e. you have a very restricted number of companies or countries which produce the particular uh, commodity you were talking about. And also can involve some political economic factors. And we've seen that in the last um, couple of months with the, the war in Russia and also some of the issues with China. Now, there's a few points I'd like to point out here about critical minerals. For, number one, critical minerals is actually a misnomer. Okay, if you actually look at, there's about 45 identified critical minerals if you go through various countries' critical mineral lists. Of those, 37 are elements. One is a gaseous element, it's helium. Two are rocks. One is a chemical. And only four are minerals. As, as, as in terms of what the geologist would define as a mineral. So it's actually a misnomer, but it's a useful misnomer because it separates minerals that are produced from the extractive industries, i.e. mining and or petroleum production, from those which are produced by other, um, other industries, um, for instance, urea or neon, which are produced by other uh, industries, but are actually also very critical. The other thing I'd like to point out is that criticality is actually in the, in the eye of the beholder. And just to illustrate this, this is the Canadian critical mineral list. And I actually use that because it's actually a very nicely designed um, thing where you have the, the maple leaf with all the different critical um, uh, minerals on, on the, shown there. Australia has its own critical mineral list. And most developed countries have their own critical uh, mineral list. Now, we, we in Australia differ from many of the other um, countries of the world in that we see ourselves as a supplier, not a consumer of critical minerals. So we supply these things. We actually don't use them within our economy. If, if we use them, they're imported as a finished product. The only critical mineral list for Australia's economy are those that are need by, needed by agriculture, for instance, phosphate or potash. So we actually have a different perspective in terms of critical minerals to most other countries. Okay, now this diagram here is just a, a diagram put out by the European Commission. And what it has is on the uh, x-axis is economic importance, and on the y-axis um, supply risk. Okay, so to be critical, a critical mineral, it has to have high economic importance and also high supply risk. So it actually has to sit in this quadrant of this diagram. Okay, and you can see a bunch of the, of the critical minerals that were actually defined by the European Commission in 2014, and I'll just highlight a couple of them. Okay, 
when people think about critical minerals, they start, usually think about the rare earth elements. That's the, the, the typical um, critical minerals. But there are a few others. And the critical and the rare earth elements actually sit right at the very top of this diagram. But interesting, other things are critical. So magnesium is a critical mineral. And surprisingly, in 2014, coking coal was a critical mineral. Okay, so this is 2014. We'll actually change. So this is the same diagram, um, again showing supply risk on the uh, x uh, y axis and economic importance on the uh, x axis. And you will actually see that those critical minerals have actually moved on this diagram. Okay, so what's happened is that the light rare earths and the heavy rare earths have combined into one, one group. But if we look at coking coal, if you remember on the previous diagram, it was over here, now it's moved to, to, down to here. So coking coal has actually become non-critical in, in this iteration. It's actually sub subsequently become critical again. And magnesium, if you remember, was sitting here in the previous diagram, it's actually moved out here and it's become extremely critical. It's one of the most critical, uh, critical minerals that we have. So these things change with time and it's important to remember that. The other thing is, is that critical minerals are, this, the market size of critical minerals is actually quite small in general. Okay, so this is data from 2017. And if you look at the major commodities, iron ore, there's, um, it's about $180 billion. That's the value of, of iron ore's uh, world production in 2017. Gold is about $130 billion. Copper, $121 billion. Then you get to the, the, the lesser uh, significant um, base metal. Zinc is about $37 billion. And then you get down to your critical minerals. Okay, so rare earths are actually about the same size as the zinc market. Okay, and that's the largest of the critical minerals. If we go to other ones, we have platinum and palladium, the platinum group elements. They're about half the size of the rare earth element things. And then if you go down to uh, uh, cobalt here, again, it's relatively small. And if you go to this, one of the smaller ones, tellurium, it's actually minuscule. So you've got to remember that when you're talking about critical minerals, they tend to have much smaller market sizes than the major elements. And so they're going to actually be, have a, lot, a, lot, a much greater tendency of fluctuations within the market in terms of market price. And they also actually have a much smaller potential impact on the bottom line. So you've got to remember that about the critical markets. But the, on the other hand, critical, mar critical minerals can actually grow very rapidly. Okay, lithium back in 2000, when, we, when I was working in the Pilbara, nobody worried about it. Now it's, it's, it's the, hot, the, the hot metal, and it's increased. So in 2021, the value was about four, $500 million, and it's projected to triple by 2026. So lithium has gone from virtually nothing to $500 million now to $1,400 million in 10 years. So it's important that some of these things can take off very, very rapidly and can, be, can become very important. But the other thing I'd like to point out, $1.4 billion in terms of when you compare it to zinc or to iron ore, it's a very small market. Okay, now the other thing about critical minerals is that there's two ways of getting them. Number one is a main or a pro, uh, co-product, i.e. it produces the main commodity produced at a particular mine. And that would include things like rare earth elements, phosphate rock, chromite, tin, tungsten, etc. The important thing about that is that the value of the critical mineral actually determines the viability of the, of the development. Okay, you want to have a mine, a phosphate rock mine is actually dependent on how the value of the phosphate uh, rock. And if it, you don't have high enough grade phosphate, you're not going to have a mine. In terms, the other way is as an, a byproduct, okay, and, and this is commonly cobalt, vanadium, 
indium, germanium, a whole bunch of things like that. The important thing about that is the value of the major commodity that determines the viability of the development. And the critical minerals is actually along for the ride. Okay? The economic viability, therefore, is largely independent of the critical mineral price. So it doesn't matter how much the price of germanium is, the price of zinc is what's going to determine the viability of that particular um, project. The other thing is the supply is not as price sensitive. So it doesn't really matter as long as you've got your, your um, recovery set up. You're recovering germanium. It doesn't matter whether it's a very low price or a very high price. You can still get it out. It doesn't cost you much to get it out. In a few cases, you have critical minerals both as a main or co-product and also a byproduct. And examples of this would be molybdenum and platinum group elements. So the, not only the economics differ, but also the way the things are produced differ. Now I'd like to have an ad for all the government organizations here. Um, there's actually a lot of government support for critical minerals. Okay, the New South Wales government has something called Critical Minerals and High Tech Metals Strategy. The Queensland government, and Tony will talk about this later, New Economy Minerals. The Commonwealth government, we have our Critical Minerals Facilitation Office and Geoscience Australia. A lot of the work that we're doing and part of uh, exploring for the future is critical minerals. And then we have a number of different government consortia. So, at the national scale in Australia, we have the GA and the state and the territory surveys. We work together on critical minerals on a lot of uh, other uh, geological data. We also have national collaborations with ANSTO, CSRO, and GA, and that's National Criticals Mineral Research and Development Center. And then we actually have international collaborations. And the one that I've been involved in the last two, three years is one between us the Geological Survey of Canada and the United States Geological Survey, and it's called the Critical Map Mineral Mapping Initiative. And we've actually been doing a lot of work in that space, and you'll be hearing that, hearing about those results in the next few years. Okay, so now I'll actually talk to about a little bit about the geology of critical minerals. And as I say, Australia is a producer of crit critical minerals, it's not a consumer of critical minerals. And therefore, we look at production of critical minerals as opportunities, geological opportunities, what, a way to get money into the country. And Roger Skiro uh, and a bunch of the rest of us actually put together a, pay, a um, GA report on critical minerals in 2013. And we actually identified four different opportunities. The first one is deposits associated with ultramafic magnetism. The second one is deposit related to granitic magnetism. The third one, which is incorporated in the rare earth element deposit, is deposits associated with erosion or the, the heavy mineral sands. And then finally, byproducts of processing of major commodities. And that's just the framework that I'm going to talk about in the next, the next few slides. OK, so we're going to first talk about critical minerals in ultramafic intrusion-related systems, okay? And this would include the intrusion-related mafic deposits, the uh, chromatid-associated nickel sulfide deposits. These occur mostly in the yield garden. And the important thing is you can see some relationships. You can see there's a good relationship between nickel on the bottom and platinum, palladium, and cobalt, exactly what you'd expect. And as a consequence, those those critical minerals are produced during the mining of chromatic associated nickel sulfide deposits and uh, other sulfide deposits. It turns out tellurium and selenium are also enriched, so these sorts of deposits might also be considered as potential sources of tellurium and selenium. And we go and we look at the lateritic nickel deposits, and we have those are again a lot of them in the Yilgarn. We've also got some in northern Queensland and also um, Fifield area in through, uh, through here, which James will be talking about in a few minutes. Okay, now the diagram you see here, Marcus showed you earlier, uh, the similar sort of diagram except the uh, cobalt content was shown as a log scale. But the thing I want to stress here, and this is work by Jehan Wang, is that the 
cobalt to nickel ratio of lateritic nickel deposits tends to be higher than the cobalt to nickel ratio of uh, sulfide deposits. And so that means that there's more potential for corporate production of, of uh, cobalt from these systems. In addition, these things can also contain scandium. So there's a lot of benefits of having a lateritic nickel deposits in terms of critical minerals. Now we'll move on to a next thing, the critical minerals in felsic intrusion related system. And the diagrams that I've been showing you are all based on the Osnaka data set, which is a data set that was put together uh, by Carl Brauhart at the University of Western Australia. Unfortunately, you can't get it uh, on the UWA website, but you can get it through the CMMI uh, website, the Critical Minerals and Ore website. And so we have, in the CMMI data set, we actually have 7,000 analyses of ores and related uh, rocks, so ores in the alteration zones around the ores. And so you can start to look at relationships between critical minerals and major uh, elements and other things just by looking at that data set. It's all classified by deposit type, so you can look at your favorite deposit type, what kind of critical minerals might be present in that uh, deposit type, and you can start to plan um, what you might consider during the economic um, development of it. So this is, again, as I say, from the Osnaka data set. And what we have is diagrams plotted against tin. So we're looking at granite-related um, tin deposits. And as you can see here, um, there's an increase in indium with tin. There's also an increase in indium with copper. And this is mainly from um, the Renison Bell deposit and related deposits in, in northwest Tasmania. And so that suggests that there's potential in these sorts of deposits for indium. And as you can see, there's some fairly high grades of indium uh, approaching 1,000 ppm in some of these samples. So there's potential for significant indium produced from these deposits. The main critical thing is actually developing a technique to get the indium out. Okay. We also see that there's a relationship between bismuth and tin in these deposits. So if you're looking at these sorts of deposits, your, your granite-related systems, you should also, in addition be to, to tin and tungsten, you should also be looking for indium and bismuth. And there might be some other ones that you might want to look for. In terms of pegmatites, obviously you look for lithium. You also can look for tin, tantalum, and niobium. And I haven't talked much about porphyry copper deposits. We had a whole day um, on Wednesday. It turns out that porphyry copper deposits, if you extract the molybdenum as a molybdenite uh, separate, you can actually also get significant amounts of rhenium, because rhenium tends to be high in molybdenum associated with porphyry copper deposits. Porphyry copper deposits are also probably some of the main producers of selenium and tellurium, and that comes out at the end of the process of copper concentrates. So there are a number of different critical minerals that are occurring with these types of systems. Now I'm going to spend a bit of time on rare earth elements. And I'm going to bring some economic facts into, into play here. For rare earth elements, not all are valued equally. Okay, and this diagram here just shows you the price in Chinese yuan uh, from about a month ago, looking at the price of these things um, according to the particular rare earth element. Now, commonly you see on the ASX, you will see a total rare earth element. They report the grades as total rare earth elements. If you look at that, you can see that it's really important on which critical mineral, uh, which rare earth element you've got. So if you look at the light rare earth elements, it turns out praseodymium and neodymium in here are actually where the values are. Lanthanum and cerium are don't have much value. If you go to the middle to the heavy ones, you're looking at uh, terbium, dysprosium, and holmium in through here. And so when you're looking at your critical minerals composition, or your rare earth element composition, you must consider which ones you've got. Okay? The other thing is this is a log scale. 
The price is a log scale. So the price of terbium is one, two, three, four orders of magnitude greater than the price of lanthanum. So there's a big change in the value of these things. The other thing I've done is just to indicate the relative value is indicated the price of different major commodities. So silver, copper, and zinc. It turns out that many of the important rare earth elements are actually more valuable than copper or zinc. And in fact, one of them is actually more valuable than silver on a per weight uh, basis. Coal uh, actually sits way up in here. So that none of them are quite gold don't have the value of gold yet. So, but some of them are more valuable than silver. Okay, so in terms of rare earth element deposits, we can actually put them into a classification. Okay, so we're going to talk about a, a four-part classification. So we're going to talk about orthomagmatic and magmatic hydrothermal deposits, and these include carbonatite and carbonatite related systems, and peralkaline magmatic uh, systems. We'll talk a little bit about hydrothermal deposits. They include iron oxide, copper, gold, and unconformity related systems. Basinal and weathering related deposits. These actually have a lot of potential in the uh, Lachlan fold belt and, 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 and the Tasman origin. And then also placer deposits also have a lot of potential um, in the Lachlan origin. Okay, so before I move on, I want to talk. I'm going to talk about LNO, which means lanthanum oxides. Okay, lanthanum, as you know, is, is the start of the lanthanides. So as you're looking at the lanthanum lutetium suite of elements, I'm not going to include yttrium or scandium when I'm talking about LNO. Okay, the other thing is that I'm going to be showing you rare earth element uh, patterns or lanthanide patterns. And these things I've normalized to chondritic values for comparison. Other people use other normalizations. Um, show, sometimes they use a shale. They're all plotted on a log logarithmic scale. And the patterns actually determine which lanthanide has the most value. Okay, so we'll actually start at carbonatite and related deposits. And so most of these deposits are in, in the Western and Central Australia. Well, all of these deposits are in Western and Central Australia. So we've got Mount Weld, Cummins Range, and Nolan's Bore. And you can see from this that the light rare earth elements, i.e lanthanum, cerium are most enriched. Okay, they're very strongly enriched. Okay, and it turns out that the value in these deposits is in praesodinium and neodymium. Okay, the other important thing here is this is really strong, well is illustrated by uh, Mount Weld, where if you look at the protor, they're actually a lot lower than the actual ore itself. And that, so there's actually a very strong enrichment due to supergene enrichment. You see the same thing at Nolan's Bore, which um, it's not shown here, but the same thing happens. And I think also at Cummins Range. So there's a very strong importance of post-formational processes for the economics of these deposits. And there's a couple of posters over there that talk about that, and I recommend you go and look at them. Okay, so we'll actually look very quickly at some deposits. So we'll look at Mount Weld. And this diagram here is from a paper by Franco Pirano. I've never actually been out to Mount Weld. Um, but what you have is an idealized cross-section where you have the carbonatite through here uh, intruding the host rocks. And this is what the carbonatite looks like. This is what the carbon carbonatite margin looks like. And then you have developed on that a weathering profile. And this is what it looks like in, in the pit. And this is what it looks like in drill core. Okay, the endowment of this deposit is 3.4 million tons of, of lanthanides and 27 kilotons of uh, yttrium. It's hosted by a weathered carbonatite. It formed at about 20, 25 million years ago. Turns out that most critical, uh, most rare earth elements actually form at strange times in the geological history of Australia. It's strongly light rare earth element enriched. And as I said, post formational weathering is essential for the economic viability. Okay, and we'll move on to the next one, which is um, Nolan's Bore, and I've actually worked on this uh, deposit. Uh, this diagram over here is a, a, is a plan of the deposit, and what we have is the, uh, the appetite load shown in green, and you can see they're actually quite late in terms of the, of the uh, timing of um, geology through here. This is what the actual ore or primary ore looks like. You have appetite. 
The appetite actually includes a lot of inc uh, inclusions of rare earth uh, silicates and rare earth carbonate minerals. And then you have some late stage carbonate veins, which also have um, rare earth carbonates and also alanite. Again, it has an endowment of about 1.4 million tons of lanthanide oxides, but it's also got uranium and phosphorus in the deposit. It formed at about 1532. Again, it's strongly rare earth element enriched, and it turns out that post-formational uh, remobilization and supergene enrichment are very important in the, in the geology of this deposit. Now we'll move on to the next one, peralkaline magmatic deposits. And you can see immediately from the rare earth element patterns that these are actually different in a lot of ways from the carbonatite related deposits. First of all, they tend to be light, weakly light rare earth element enriched, i.e. have a slightly, a, a slightly negative slope through here to heavy rare earth element enriched, okay? And so you can see a, a positive slope. And it turns out that the value is in the heavy rare earth elements, the dysprosium and trivium. They have a lower overall rare earth element grade, but because the value of dysprosium and trivium is much higher, you can actually mine a much lower grade. Okay? It's also important, and um, Ian Chalmers will talk about this later, um, uh, there's some important uh, co-products, niobium, zirconium, yttrium, etc., and these can be very, very important in these, in these um, deposits. And they themselves are critical minerals. Okay, and I'm not going to talk very much about Tungi because Ian's going to talk about it in a couple of minutes. So this is Tungi, and this is just a diagram taken from his paper, um, and it just shows you that the Tungi is associated with a number of, of um, Jurassic uh, peralkaline um, <coughs> bodies, and a few of them are strongly mineralized, Tunga being, being the main one, but there's another one up in here. In terms of its endowment, it has a point, uh, 0.55 million tons of lanthanum, lanthanum oxides, or lanthanide oxides. This is actually very a very large resource in terms of uh, heavy and intermediate um, uh, rare earth elements. It's also got yttrium, hafnium, tantalum, niobium, and zirconium. All of these are critical minerals. It's hosted by the Tungi trachyte. Again, it formed in the, in the uh, Jurassic. It's weakly light rare earth element enrichment. And there's some post-formational deposition and supergene <coughs> enrichment. We'll move on to the next lot of deposits. These are the hydrothermal deposits. And they include the classic deposit, Olympic Dam. It's an iron oxide copper gold deposit. But if you use estimates that have been published by a number of people, including Jehan Wang, one of, Wang, one of my uh, co-authors, uh, co the endowment is something like 50 million tons of lanthanum, lanthanide oxides plus yttrium. And that's actually the second largest deposit in the world after Bayan Obo. It's hosted by the Olympic Dam Breccia complex. It formed at about 1590 with some later remobilization, and it's strongly light rare earth element enriched. Now, they're actually looking at the viability of getting the, light, the rare earth elements out of this deposit. Uh, I'm not sure what the progress is, but they're actually working on it. So if this comes on, 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 on board, then you have to think about what that does to the, to the rare earth element or the light rare earth element uh, market. The other example that I've shown here, and this is quite different from Olympic Dam, it's, very, it's a it's very strongly heavy rare earth element enriched. Um, it's an unconformity related uranium deposits, and so you can see the, um, the stars shown in the blue. The blue is the basement, and it's just right along the unconformity with the um, yellow rocks here. And these things are about 1650 to 1610. It's important that the xenotime is the main ore mineral, which means that you don't have to worry about uh, uranium or thorium as a significant um, poison element. And it's, as I said before, it's strongly heavy rare earth element enriched. Okay, so now we'll move on to the next lot, and these are basinal and, and weathering related um, deposits. And, and Tony will hopefully talk a little bit about um, the first one, which is in the Georgina Basin. It's the Ardmore deposit. And these things are associated with uh, phosphates. They're 
uh, about 505 uh, million years, and they're actually within the Georgina Basin. The grade, we'll call it quote-unquote grade, is about 1,700 uh, ppm lanthanide, lanthanide, lanthanide oxides. It's hosted by phosphorites, and it's weakly light rare earth element enriched. But because of that, the value actually is in the heavy, mineral, the heavy rare earth elements, the terbium. Um, so that's the other thing. Now, another thing which has just been recently discovered is the uh, Cooper Murray base, uh, deposit, which is located in the Murray Basin. Um, it's an iron absorption clay deposit. And just reading around the, the mining literature uh, or the, you know, uh, the mining news, you're actually, people are starting to recognize things in other parts of Australia. So these things potentially could be significant deposits within Australia. It's something that we need to think about. There are probably more of them in the, in the Murray Basin. There are probably more of them outside of the Murray Basin. It's hosted by a clay unit overlying a limestone. It's active, it's currently forming, and it's weakly light rare earth element enriched, but the value again is in the heavies. And finally, plaster deposits, the heavy mineral sands deposits, and we're just using again the Murray Basin here, and this is the extent of the Loxton sands, shown in through in this sort of a, a beigey brown color, and the actual deposits, and these are the ones ho uh, owned by Aluka, I think there's some more in there, uh, are shown in, in yellow. And these things are hosted by the Loxton uh, sands. They formed about 6.1 million years ago, so they're technically paleoplasters. Um, they contain most, both monazite, which is a light rare earth element rich mineral, and also xenotime, which is a medium to heavy mineral uh, rare earth element uh, rich mineral. And so it's important you have potential in these deposits for extracting both the heavies and the lights. And I think there's some differences spatially in terms of which deposits contain heavies and which, depo which, which deposits contain xenotime and which deposits contain monazine. And that's something that, that should be looked at. I'd like to point out that prior to the mid-1990s, we actually did produce uh, monazite from these deposits. It's only since the 1990s uh, when um, it's recognized that the, the, the hazard of, of thorium, that they stopped producing it. Some companies are now reporting and extracting the monazite and the xenotine, particularly in Western Australia at Iniaba. The other thing in terms of the size of the thing, there are about 33 million tons of heavy minerals um, a, uh, that are owned by Eluca Resources. And I think it's of the order of several percent, of one or two or three percent of those heavy minerals are actually uh, xenotime and monazite. So that gives you a feel for the size of, of the resource. The last thing I'm going to talk about is critical minerals which are recovered from uh, major commodities concentrates. And so for copper concentrates, you can extract uh, selenium, tellurium, cobalt, bismuth, and, and PGEs. And when I say this, I'm talking not about the um, porphyry copper deposits in, in, in New South Wales, but about the uh, nickel uh, lateral, uh, the chromatidate associated nickel sulfide deposits in Western Australia. In the uh, nickel concentrates, you can also get, you can get cobalt and also get uh, PGEs, molybdenum concentrates, and these are mainly from the porphyry copper deposits, and also um, Merlin in, 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 in north, northwest Queensland, you can actually get significant uh, uranium. Lead concentrates, you can get bismuth. And zinc concentrates, which I'll concentrate a little bit more on, you can get cadmium, which is probably no use to anybody, but you can also get indium, germanium, and gallium. And just to, to, to show this, the importance of this, this diagram here is looking at the concentration of different, uh, of germanium and indium in sphalerite, okay? Back in the 1940s, it was discovered that germanium tends to be enriched in lower temperature deposits, whereas indium tends to be enriched in higher temperature deposits. Now this has been su subsequently really demonstrated to be the case. Uh, a fellow named Fresnel in Germany actually produced a geothermometer based on germanium, indium, and gallium contents of salarite. So you could actually estimate the uh, temperature formation of these deposits using those, those uh, elements. And so Fresnel actually um, tabulated 
a whole bunch of analyses um, for these deposits. And so I, we've expanded that thing, and you can actually see that um, if you look at high temperature versus low temperature, the, the high temperature being in the greens and the low temperature being in the reds, those red squares, you actually see that there's a differentiation of higher germanium and lower uh, indium uh, sphalerite in here, and that's dominated by NVT type deposits and also some uh, sediment hosted uh, lead zinc deposits. Whereas indium uh, and higher indium and lower germanium uh, de sphalerite tends to be associated with VHMS deposits and scarring deposits. So you can actually say what kind of a deposit are you looking at? Well, if it's mid, uh, sediment uh, MVT deposits, I'm just about done. <laughs> <laughs> if it's MVT deposits, then you can say look for the germanium. If it's a VHMS deposit or a scar deposit, look for indium. And so you can actually use that as a guide. And there's my conclusions, which I won't read out. 